And so hopefully so far you've basically gotten the idea that you know there's a large number of different types of networks uh, that people look at. All of these network assays are like super noisy. So they have you know lots of false positives, lots of false negatives. Um, they're hard to reproduce. And you should also get the sense that there's a lot of factors that are, you know, that underlie these issues of noisiness and poor reproducibility. Namely that when you're talking about like protein protein interaction networks, you know, you can have these like proteins that uh, non-specifically interact with many other proteins in the in the genome. And so your protein protein interaction assay will detect lots of interactions, but they don't actually happen in vivo because other factors like um, expression patterns basically prevent those non-specific interactions from actually happening. In the case of genetic interaction networks, uh, you're limited by your ability to measure, uh, you know, a very limited number of phenotypes like fitness. Um, in the case of co-expression networks, you're limited by the fact that you need lots of samples in order to measure co-expression. Um, and yeah, you have batch effects to deal with. But, you know, it's not just the technical factors that make these networks uh, hard to work with. There's also biological ones, right? And so one of the biggest biological factors is that, you know what, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of interactions are context dependent and cell type specific. And so in theory, there's no such thing as a single PPI network for yeast. There's a PPI network for every different kind of condition that you might subject yeast to, including like starvation or whatever. Um, in humans, you have a PPI network, not just for every type of cell in your human body, but every context that you can find that cell type in. Um, a lot of these interactions that we talk about, especially the ones, um, I think that PPI networks, they're, I mean, they're not in vitro, but they're, it, it is a synthetic environment. And so you're not measuring these PPI interactions in vivo uh, in humans, for example, you're expressing human proteins in yeast and then measuring whether or not they interact in yeast. And so there's a lot of differences between like real kind of in vivo conditions versus what you're doing in the assay. Um, and so one broader point to make here is that what makes studying things like networks and what we'll talk about in you know in terms of epigenomes and transcriptomes later is that measuring, measuring and analyzing anything other than DNA sequence or the genomic sequence is really hard because everything other than genomic sequence is highly dynamic. Right. It's highly cell type specific, highly context specific. And so in theory, to really understand what proteins, you know, a certain protein is interacting with, you have to measure PPI networks in many different conditions. And so it, it just makes it really hard. Um, and so from a practical consideration, one of the one of the big take home messages here is that these networks, no matter which one you look at, are super noisy. And so if you are interested in just very specific interactions, if you have questions about, you know, does this gene A interact specifically with gene B, none of these assays, uh, except for maybe ChIP-seq, if you have the right antibodies, none of these assays are probably the right assay you should be looking at. Um, because they're so noisy, individual edges in this graph, in these graphs, are, you know, have a high likelihood of, you know, individually being wrong, right? And so that then begs the question, well, if individual edges in this in these graphs are wrong, then why am I even bothering doing these assays? Um, and the, the answer to that is basically that these assays are good for getting kind of like systems level views of gene regulation or how proteins interact. They're very good at making kind of like broad statements about, um, you know, what, te what types of genes tend to be interacting with other types of genes and, um, uh, basically trying to measure, for example, and we'll talk about this in a second, uh, they're good for identifying genes that have a lot of structural importance to the genome, even if the individual interactions that you identify are, are noisy. So the next few slides are going to cover how we identify important genes uh, from any of these kinds of interaction networks. And so uh, there's no really singular metric for measuring gene importance. So we'll discuss a few common ones like degree centrality and betweenness centrality. We'll also discuss how to use networks to identify groups of genes that function together. So because I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, individual edges in an interaction network are typically super noisy and unreliable. 
Uh, oftentimes it's easier to infer information about groups of genes functioning together rather than individual genes. And so we'll talk a little bit about identifying communities, um, <clears throat> looking at certain recurring types of structures within networks called network motifs. We'll talk a little bit about um, finding communities within networks and uh, learning about gene function through what's called guilt by association. And so the idea behind the so-called centrality measures of networks is that a centrality measure is a way of measuring the importance of an individual node or edge to the structural features uh, of an interaction network. So here I'm giving an example of, for example, in the bottom right hand corner of the diagram uh, of a high connectivity node. So that's a node that has many edges to many other nodes in the network. Um, and those typically are what people traditionally think of as important nodes in the network because they they connect to a lot of other genes. And so it's it's like a, you know, you could imagine, for example, a transcription factor that regulates thousands of other genes is, you know, likely to play some kind of important role. Um, less obvious are nodes that don't necessarily have a high degree or like, you know, are connected to many other nodes in the network per se, but they are good at connecting different groups of nodes. And so those uh, nodes, like the one I'm showing you on the left-hand side of the diagram are nodes that again, have low degree, but could still be important because they connect many different kind of processes or groups of nodes together. And so the first measure of importance, the first centrality measure is what's called degree centrality. And the idea of degree centrality is really, uh, it's really just asking for every node, how many other nodes is that gene connected to? And so if you, so there's really two ways of calculating a degree centrality, you can either look at a graph and say, okay, well, for each node in the graph, how many other nodes is it connected to? Uh, and, you know, that's how you can calculate its degree. Uh, usually what's also easy is from the adjacency matrix that we talked about before. So again, an adjacency matrix is just a matrix where the rows and the columns refer to different nodes in the graph. And a zero in an entry in this matrix tells you that there's no edge between a pair of genes. Whereas a one tells you there is an edge between a pair of genes. And so you can easily kind of calculate the degree of a node using adjacency matrix by just looking across every row in this adjacency matrix and just adding up the number of times you see one in that row. And that tells you the degree of that node. And so the second measure of importance is what's called between a centrality. And so what between a centrality tries to tell you about is the uh, is how much a particular node or gene in the network connects other nodes in the network. And so officially, the way you calculate between this is you basically just uh, count up the number of paths between any pair of nodes uh, that pass through the current node. And so suppose we're looking at node B in this, in this network and we're trying to calculate its between the centrality we basically look at all pairs of nodes where the pair does not include the node B. And we just, and we look at the shortest path between those two nodes in the network. And we just count the number of shortest paths that have to pass through B. And so some examples of the shortest paths between pairs of nodes that don't include B, but pass through B, include uh, the shortest path between A and D, A and E, C and D and C and E, uh, as well as D and E. And so in this hypothetical example, the betweenness of node B would be five. And so the idea here is that nodes with high betweenness centrality are essentially nodes that um, control information in the network because they, they connect a lot of different genes, um, not necessarily directly, but also indirectly. And so that's in contrast to nodes with high degree centrality, where those nodes are directly, in some sense, talking to many other genes directly. Uh, in the network. And so it's important to note that the between the centrality and degree centrality measures of importance don't necessarily point you to the same nodes in the network. And so in this hypothetical example of a, of a network, uh, node A has the highest degree centrality because it connects to five other nodes. Whereas node B is actually the most central according to between us because it connects a lot of different groups of nodes. And so intuitively, even from this diagram, without knowing, you know, without remembering exactly what the between us centrality measure means, you can already kind of see how B, um, B might be important in this network because it, it connects 
a lot of different groups of nodes.